Welcome to the FAA Production Studios and the FAA Safety Teams National Resource Center located in the Sun and Fun Complex in Lakeland, Florida. Our next presenter comes from a family of pilots and he started flying in 1963. After college, he joined the Navy and has flown over 247 different aircraft and retired as a captain of a Boeing 747. He is currently the FAA safety team manager in Saddlebrook, New Jersey's Flight Standards District office. And his topic today is takeoff and landing in vintage aircraft. Let's welcome Bob Thorson. Thank you all for the kind words. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. As Walt mentioned, I'm from Saddlebrook, New Jersey, and I also do part of the lower New York State area. And I want to talk specifically about some of the operations that I've seen in the last several years on vintage and surplus aircraft. Now, I have to give you a slight definition, and when I say vintage, I'm talking about most of the airplanes that have round engines that are over 25 years old. And the surplus aircraft are those that we ha know that have a military history and have been uh, set up as, um, I guess, a, a recreational or leisure airplane, many of the ones that we see all over the world flying. Um, this may be a little bit different than what you're used to seeing for a definition of warbirds, and uh, as we go on, I'll get into more specific definitions. Uh, I'm Bob Thorson. Uh, Walt gave me an excellent introduction. But I'd like to tell you that I'm a pilot just like every other one of you in the audience. Um, I've flown for the airlines, I've flown for commuters, I've flight instructed, and I've flown warbirds. I've pursued aviation as a vocation and also as an avocation. It's given me a lot of great years. I have a great deal of passion about it, and you'll see that as it goes on. And most of the people that know me know me that I'll have grease on my uh, hands and elbows 10 minutes before an air show and I'll be out there flying the airplane as well. I want to take just a second here to thank a lot of people because I didn't make this speech on my own. Um, Doug Rosendahl from the Commemorative Air Force and I talk quite a bit. Um, what I'm going to say today is maybe not too different from what you heard at the National Warbird Operators Convention a couple of months ago. Um, and I'd also like to thank the EA and the EA Warbirds chapter for putting uh, Sun and Fun on and sponsoring these types of forums all around the country. We're here because my basic job is to reduce accidents in my specific area uh, by education and outreach. And this is one of the things I do. Um, I don't only do Warbirds, I do helicopters, uh, general aviation, and air carrier work as well. I just picked this warbird topic today because it's near and dear to my heart and it's a lot of fun for me to do. So we want to talk about some of the things that I've seen by history and also by the statistics and then I want to tell you a few things that we can do to lower the risk. In other words, mitigation strategies uh, for flying warbirds and also vintage airplanes. I'm going to do a historical piece first about what the statistics tell me. Um, the statistics were prepared by the Accident Investigation uh, Office in Washington, D.C. Um, hopefully, uh, this is a custom presentation of these statistics, and I've taken some liberties when I did that. I took the helicopters out because a lot of them were used um, in law enforcement, and uh, some of them were used in agricultural work and external load. In other words, they were previous military airplanes and public agencies took them over to use. Um, we want to talk about education and outreach because frankly I wish I could do something so easy as to reduce the accident rate because I can't do it. You really have to do it. I need to convince you and every one of you to fly airplanes to do some type of strategy and some type of planning before you fly to reduce the accidents that you may put yourself in a position to get involved with. Um, I think a little bit earlier in this week, uh, one of the other FPMs from Washington, D.C., Karen Art, talked about risk management. I'm not going to go into that deeply because I think most everybody at this point in time understands 
risk management and what we're talking about. Basically, you look and see how you can get yourself in trouble and you do something about it before you put yourself in that position. And then once again, I want to talk about best practices because there are some things that pilots do as a group that are best practices that reduce the chance of you having an accident. I took a 10-year um, cut out of the statistics from 1999 to 2008. And the people on AI 100 gave it to me in a Excel spreadsheet with just the numbers. Now, these aren't, I should kind of correct myself because these aren't rates, these are actually counts of worldwide warbird accidents. In other words, every one of those dots represents an accident over that 10 year period in the world. And you can see that there are unregistered airplanes that are warbirds flying outside the United States. Some in the Pacific, some in the Caribbean, uh, and some up into Canada. But the bulk of them are pretty much within the domestic United States. Here's what, if you enlarge a domestic chart, here's what it looks like. And you'll see that, unbelievably enough, there's a even geographic distribution across the whole United States. You might notice that if you get out into the Los Angeles uh, basin, that there is a cluster there as well as around this area. And I think that's because there's quite a few warbird owners in those areas, and I think that the more population you have, and you look at the accident by counts, that's what you're going to see, just a higher count rate in those areas. I don't think there's any, anything statistically significant about it. I had somebody from our 290 branch in our region up in New York who is a statistical analysis agent go back and look at all these things and see if he could come up with anything. And the only thing he told me was that there were a high number of accidents during maneuvering flight. We'll talk about that when we get a little bit further into the presentation. If you look from year to year, it's kind of interesting since 2001, it's been trending down and I'm certainly happy about that and I'm sure a lot of other people are. Um, I can tell you that if you look at the general aviation accident statistics, um, you'll see changes from year to year. If you go back to 1999, you'll see that it's probably the lowest year. So we've had good years like in 2006 and we've had bad years like in 2001. Um, but once again, if you look at the left side of this graph, you'll see that that's 21 or 22 accidents. And out of the total number of flying warbirds, that's relatively low. 2009, hopefully, um, because of a lot of the things that are going on, more mentoring programs, more educational programs from uh, clubs and associations, that we'll see a continued decrease. I decided I wanted to look at the types of operation because every day as a fast team program manager, I go in and look at accidents by types of operation. How many happen in takeoffs? How many happen in landings? How many happen on approach? How many out of circling approaches? How many of them were helicopters, gliders, and the, and the like? And for a warbird specifically, I don't really see anything much different. You'll see that roughly half of the accidents occur in the landing phase um, and a little bit during a takeoff, maybe 25 percent of the total are during takeoffs. And you'll see that light blue section up to the um, uh, top of the uh, pie chart that says maneuver. I used a little bit of a different definition. If you go in the regulations, you won't really see a maneuver definition. If you go to the latest um, NAL report, you'll see that they consider a maneuver anything down to basically short final and shortly after takeoff. Maneuver for me is anytime the airplane is doing anything not necessarily acrobatic but outside of the pattern. So you, warbirds you typically have a higher number of aerobatic um, operations going on and you typically see people flying 90 degree or 360 degree overhead approaches and this isn't what you would normally see in a general aviation fleet. So I pulled a maneuver out and you can see that, that um, anything that has to do with low airspeed or close to the ground, which means takeoff, maneuvering, and landing, is pretty much 80% of our problem. Climb, cruise, descent, and the go-arounds, they're relatively small. It's kind of surprising because 
I would have thought that in a go-around in an airplane with a large engine, you'd see more problems. You know, historically, you've heard the, the rumor about P-51s on torque rolls or an A-1 Sky Raider doing a torque roll on takeoff or a sudden application of power, but we don't see those types of accidents happening. We normally see them happening when the airspeed is low and the closer to the ground that you get. I also cut them out by types of aircraft. Now, I pulled most of the helicopters out, as I told you previously, because they don't apply. Um, a lot of surplus helicopters that came from the Army and the Air Force and the Navy are used in airborne law enforcement, ALE as we call it. For example, several major cities around the country use them um, in the law enforcement mode. And that's not really what I wanted to talk about. Those folks are in a different breed and category and a type of operation compared to what we normally see. These are strictly propeller and jet-powered airplanes and some helicopters that are involved in doing uh, air shows such as Sun and Fun or, or the EA Air Venture at Oshkosh. And this is what I see. It's basically propeller airplanes and that's, we all know that because the bulk of the airplanes from World War II and Korea are what we all know and love and they're the ones that compromise the largest part of the fleet. But you can see that that turbojet blue area is almost 25 percent of the total. And um, as, as you look at the statistics like I do on Monday mornings and most mornings, uh, there's a fairly large number of classic war jets or warbirds that are having problems. And that population is growing tremendously as well. So we need to reach out to those folks and talk to them about some of the things that are going on today. I can tell you that the guys that I hang out with are probably all my age and are mid, in my age in their mid-60s and um, we're not the 18-year-olds that were flying the F-4s in Vietnam and the A-5s and the A-4s and the Sky Raiders and all the different airplanes. So we're later in life and uh, we're probably not as quick as we were when we were kids. But having said that, we're still making almost the same accidents uh, that the general aviation population does on a day-to-day -day basis. The only difference is if you have an accident in a warbird, um, the possibility of a fatality or a very serious injury is much higher. And I think it's got a lot to do with people pushing the envelope and maybe as you get older you might think about what you're doing a little more carefully and not putting yourself in an area where you can't dig yourself out of. Let's get into the education part about this. Um, I saw this the other day, experience is what you learn shortly after you needed it. And there couldn't be a truer statement anywhere. Um, I can tell you that I've learned some things on my own because of my own uh, view of aviation. I used to dig and push the envelope and experiment. I started out when I was in the Navy doing things that most people wouldn't do with an airplane. I had a license before I got in the Navy and maybe that was part of that culture. And of course it was a time of war of Vietnam so I really didn't think to the future. If I could get through the war I would have been happy. I was only looking a few years ahead. But we don't want to do that today in Warbirds because most of these airplanes are older airframes so we want to fly them gently. The pilots are older so we want to be careful that we're in shape, physical shape when we get there. And we want to think about what we don't know about the maintenance and the operation of this airplane that we should know. Part of the human factors, part of aviation is that we are human. We're human beings and believe it or not, we're not robots. We make a lot of errors. Um, friends of mine always tell me that the best pilot doesn't worry about the errors he makes, but he has a whole bunch of recovery procedures in his pocket that he knows how to pull them out and get himself out of a problem that he may get himself into. And I want to talk about some of these that are specific to Warbird and vintage airplanes. One of them is age and physical fitness. Um, as I mentioned, I wish I could uh, uh, jump up and do things that I used to. I can't. I mean, my brain still thinks I'm 18, but my hands and eyes are not 18. And so I can't do that. The other thing that I like to bring up, I call the Yahoo factor. Now we learned this week at Sun and Fun that there are several other pilots around here that understand what I'm saying 
but they call it differently. Like Corky Fornoff calls it the Yippee Factor, and it, you may have noticed that on the belly of his airplane, he's got Yippee on there, which is great. But it basically always goes down to the uh, loss of inhibition. And what I'm going to talk to you about a few things that, that cause this loss of inhibition and put you into a position that you didn't want to go to in the first place. I want to talk about egos. Everybody's got an ego, and warbird pilots have fairly large egos. And rightfully so, because they've gotten to that part in their flying career that they can afford an expensive airplane. They got qualified in it. They're very proud of it. They probably spent many hours uh, working on it, restoring it, polishing it. And that generally strokes your ego. And I, but I want to tell you about the downside of that and how to keep that under control. Habit patterns. You know, flying is a habit, believe it or not. And what you do every day in training in testing is what comes out when you have an emergency. So if you don't do it today, if you don't train right today, if you don't test right today, when your time comes, you won't be ready to perform. The other thing I want to talk about is awareness. I mean, one of the biggest terms in aviation is situational awareness, but I want to talk to you about it in a broader term, about just general awareness of what's going on and how you can change your awareness by a close-in focus and a distant focus and what causes that to occur. Let's get into the specifics about age and physical fitness. Everybody's got a chronological age and everybody's got an actual age. You can look at any of your friends and some people age better than others and some people don't age as well. And depending on your occupation, you may keep your muscles up to a better strength than someone else. If you're flying some warbirds, like an A26, it takes a great deal of arm strength to muscle that airplane around. Other airplanes, the fighters, they're fairly light on the stick. You don't need that much muscle. But if you're my age and I'm going to fly an A26, you're going to see me at the gym much like the Blue Angels are at the gym every day, working on my upper arm strength because I know I'm going to need it in that airplane for a lot of maneuvers. The other thing is, is chronologically, um, uh, certain things happen to you. You probably sleep less as you get older. One of the most interesting sleep studies I just saw uh, said that you're really not awake until 20 minutes after your eyes open. In other words, you're awake and you sense that you're awake, but you're not fully functioning until 20 minutes later. Think about those poor Battle of Britain pilots who were sleeping in the grass in five minutes later, they're up into their Spitfires and launching and climbing through four or 5,000 feet, ready to engage in a battle. I bet you most of them weren't at their peak performance. Same thing uh, flying your airplane. If you're not well rested the night before, and you're not ready to go fly it, don't do it. And as you get older, don't think that you can do it like you were 20 or 30 or 40, because you just can't do that. Believe it or not, and I know people don't like to hear this, flying is a demanding physical sport. And my AME happens to be a, a very good one. He is a senior AME, and he's also a lawyer, so I get the benefit of asking him legal questions about aviation while he's giving me my medical examination. And we talk about it being a demanding physical sport all the time. Um, if you think back about World War II or pre-Korea or pre-Vietnam eras, most of the military did calisthenics, and the reason they were doing calisthenics is get the muscle tone up, get the brain pumping more blood, and getting all the physiological parts of you up to speed to fly a military airplane. Now, I can't tell you how many people that I know don't do that. If you're flying a P-51 today, the same physical demand is on you as any of the pilots in World War II or Korea. You need to think about that, and I'm talking about some physical conditioning. I'm not necessarily talking about the grueling uh, physical conditioning that maybe the Blue Angels go through you know, prior to show, but if it's spring, like it is now, it's the start of the Seymour, uh, Seymour Johnson Air Show, it's the start of the air show season this weekend, you need to have gotten yourself into some good flying physical condition before now. You need to start thinking about it back in January and February. And <clears throat> so that there is less of an impact upon your ability to fly. If you're not physically fit, 
you're not going to do as well. If you have a problem, you're not going to be thinking as well. If you're pulling a lot of G's like some of these acrobatic pilots out here, it's going to tire you out a lot quicker in a routine. And then you start losing your edge that you keep up. The other thing is it shows and any time the heat and dehydration um, is a very serious issue about physical fitness. Um, and any given day I can tell you that, that um, you should drink probably between five and eight glasses of water. And if you're one of these shows, you should be probably drinking a lot more. If you look at most of the competitive people in the International Aerobatic Council, you'll always see them walking around with a water bottle and there's a very good reason for that. Your body needs water to make you uh, provide peak performance and also peak mental performance. If you fly in an airplane that's got an open cockpit or a glass canopy, this is taking the water out of your body at a much higher rate. And I can tell you, I've flown to B-17 probably for 16 or 17 years at Memphis Bell with Dave Talashe, and at the end of a day, I probably have lost five to six pounds of water loss just sitting in that. And it's not all glass canopy. I mean, we have plenty of windows, but it gets so warm in there, there's no air conditioning. So that's another part of this uh, age, uh, physical fitness part of flying. Doug Rosendahl and I were talking about the use of oxygen and we had differing views and I'll tell you why. I've done a lot of my boar bird flying in England. And you'll see the people in England always have in their Spitfires or any of their airplanes, hurricanes, they have their oxygen mask on shortly after start because there's a great amount of carbon dioxide coming off the engines. And uh, we should probably think about that with our flying in this country. If you have an oxygen system built into your airplane, I would suggest you use it. This is also true for the cross-country part because I noticed that a lot of the Warbird guys are flying higher and higher to stay above the terminal flight restrictions, TFRs, so they don't have to worry about getting violated. What they're doing is they're flying up in the mid-teens. Put that oxygen mask on. I know a lot of people can sustain flight at 12 to 14,000 feet without oxygen, but I'll tell you what, after a two or three hour flight, when you come down into the pattern here, you're gonna see a tremendously reduced performance if you're not breathing oxygen. The other thing is, is if there's a fire um, in your airplane, you have that oxygen mask on and a helmet on, you've got maximum protection. Um, there's been a couple accidents in the last month of pilots and warbirds getting severely burned because they didn't have the proper flying equipment on. No max gloves, no max flight suit, oxygen mask covering your face and a helmet. The last thing I want to talk about in this area is fatigue. Um, I flew 767s and 747s most of my life for an international airline and I can tell you that I've been on my hands and knees after flying for two or three days, particularly coming back from Tokyo. My body would just not adjust to the time zone. I've tried all kinds of techniques. I've sat outside in the sun. I've changed my eating habits, more protein, less carbohydrates, and everything I can. But in the end, your body, when you move those circadian rhythms by crossing time zones, they need a certain amount of time to catch up. And if you don't do that, and you come to a show, and you've just been on the other side of the earth, you're asking for problems. Or even if you just want to go train in your warbird on a Saturday. Um, I can tell you that when I was in England, there was at least two or three accidents of pilots who lost control of the airplanes doing very low altitude acrobatics and when they went back and looked at their history of what they had been doing the last four or five days they were out flying on a different part of the earth and they were very tired they got back home they probably had four to six hours of sleep and they were in an air show doing acrobatics that's not really good I mean you're setting yourself up if you don't think about these things and give yourself a breathing room and making sure you're fully rested um, you're going to cause some problems. There's also cumulative fatigue. If you're on vacation and you're spending a week or two someplace else and your body gets adjusted to say Italy or India and you come back to the States and you want to fly, I think I'd give yourself a little bit of a breathing room on that as well. The Yahoo factor or the Yippee factor. The psychological term is a loss of inhibition. I did some studying on this um, with Scott Chappelle, who is one of the noted 
human factors guys in the United States. And it's kind of amazing uh, that it really goes back to your personality trait in your earliest childhood. I don't want to get too much into the psychological part about it, but I want to tell you some of the triggers that you might see to cause you to get a loss of inhibition. Now I can tell you there's probably not a person watching this presentation today that hasn't thought about getting in the airplane, pushing the power up, snapping the gear up, keeping it low to the runway, and pulling up into a barrel roll at the end of the runway. Well, you know, if you have all the wavered airspace and you have all the credentials and you've been approved by the authorities to do that, good luck. But the problem is, is that everybody has that in their mind and most people don't do it because that inhibition prevents them from doing that type of maneuver for a variety of reasons. But there are some personalities um, that, are, that don't have that high of an inhibition and they will do a maneuver like that. Two of the biggest triggers that you're ever going to find, and particularly at an air show, are the camera or peer pressure. If I'm flying in front of people that I know from the military, or I know from the warbird scene, or at some of the air shows that I go to every year, I have to really tell myself, don't go so low, don't do certain things. Because I know that they're looking at me, and at the end of the day say, gee, you know, you weren't at 200 feet, you were at 300 feet. Or gee, that watermelon drop didn't go off very well. You were like a thousand yards away. That little subtle hazing that goes on after an air show. So the peer pressure puts this on you. You want to be aware of this. You know, don't do that because professional discipline in aviation is everything, particularly when you're flying warbirds. The other thing is the camera. The camera makes people ham it up, makes them do all kinds of crazy things. If they know somebody, even if it's a neighbor at a private strip taking a picture of you in your Yak-52 doing a couple slow rolls or a high-speed pass, for some reason, with a certain personality and those two triggers, you end up with the same um, end result. Be careful about those types of things. Don't let that Yahoo factor get in your way. This is also true of pushing the envelope. Some people have very um, aggressive flight characteristics. They don't care about going over air speeds, going beyond airframe limits. They say, well, it's built to 150%. So if I can do a 5G maneuver, why can't I do a 7G maneuver? Well, that's pushing the envelope beyond what the airplane was designed to do. You shouldn't do that. Stay within the parameters of the airplane. And the older the airplane gets, you know, these things, it's really hard to tell if you're flying a wooden airplane, how good is that glue bond? Is it going to hold together? How good are all those cables on the wings? How strong are your spars? How much corrosion has occurred in the spar that you're not aware of? That airplane may be not capable of only holding the book limits. If you stay to the book limits, there's a little buffer between what it was designed to do and where you're flying. So don't push the envelope. Don't try maneuvers that, that your airplane is not designed to, to do. I watched somebody this week do something. I've seen a couple things this week that I personally would never do, and uh, I doubt if Bob Hoover would do it. But the guys are very good at, at what they do, and I'm sure they designed some safety and some mitigating factors into it. But if you're an average warbird pilot, don't push the envelope. Don't do new, new maneuvers without training practice. Any good person knows that they'll go to altitude first, four or 5,000 feet, if you have a new routine or a new maneuver you want to perfect. I just lost a good friend less than a month ago that didn't have a lot of experience doing acrobatics. And uh, while the final conclusion's not out, um, everybody that saw it, including his son, um, pretty much know the end result. And it was a new maneuver and he had not practiced it at altitude. Had he had a few more thousand feet, he might be with us today. So don't do new maneuvers without training practice, without somebody with you that's doing, that does it regularly, that can train you and walk you through it. Um, one of the things that help our mentors, I can tell you that the EAA Warbirds magazine last month was wonderful. They brought up more safety issues and more mentoring issues than I've ever seen. 
Mentoring typically can happen within a group of pilots. It can happen through an organization such as EA Warbirds, Commemorative Air Force, uh, CJAA for the jet folks, and any other number of ways. The guy that originally taught you how to fly. But if, if you mentor somebody, try to keep them under control. I have a couple of young kids that I got into the National Guard, and you know we have a lot of talks about not, they have a lot of energy. I said, please don't get yourself too far on that limb. That, you know, they're, they're pushing all the time, and they're good, but you know, I try to rein them back, and I would suggest that you do the same thing. Pay attention to the articles in these magazines that mentor, and pay attention to your uh, friends that fly the same type of aircraft. I talked about egos. Um, they come in varying sizes and shapes. You, you can't say that every P-51 pilot does a certain thing or every B-17 pilot has a certain characteristic because you're not in the military. You haven't been psychologically pushed into a hole or tested uh, to be a fighter pilot or a bomber pilot or whatever it may be. So we have people of all different backgrounds, some people that are working in industry, uh, in the stock markets, that are doctors, that are plumbers, that are one of everything. And FAA inspectors like myself that do air shows and you have all different kinds of varying egos. So when you're flying with somebody, particularly in formation, get to know them, spend some time with them. Uh, I don't let anybody fly on my wing unless I know who they are, much like I won't work on a uh, flying airplane unless I've worked on it and I know the mechanical condition of it. Ego and peer pressure. If you get pushed with a large ego by your peers too much, what'll happen is they'll pull out of the group was at the Reno Air Races three years ago, and one of the world-noted astronaut was there. And I wanted to get, go up and say something to him, but whoever was running the air show, and he had had some kind of a conflict, and the group of Warbird pilots that were running the pylons there, I guess must have been tough on him, so he decided that he was gonna sit over in this row and separate himself from the crowd. And that's, when you see that, the first thing you wanna do is, if you get a chance, get with that person and bring them back into the group and keep them within that group because when guys start going off on their own, that means their ego is out of control. Don't let that happen because, and don't let that happen to you in particular. We all lead busy lives today. No matter where you go, somebody's pulling their cell phone out, pulling their computer out, pulling their iPod out, meaning, you know, making the kids' ball games on Saturdays, having things to do at work, having things to do at home. You know, if you're gonna go fly, give yourself some breathing room. Pick a time that you know that you're gonna be up, up to speed. You know, a lot of people will fly on a Saturday morning. I particularly think that's a good idea because it's the end of the week. You can sleep in and you're rested and you're ready to go. But don't let your time or your schedule pressure you into doing something. A lot of people say, their egos come and talk and say, I can do anything. I can do anything with any amount of time. One of the things about military trained pilots um, that I like, and this is my opinion, is that the first thing that they learn is how to keep their egos in check. And it's mostly because a drill sergeant is sitting there threatening you to within an inch of your life. They push you as hard as they can. They don't let you sleep. They physically run you around all kinds of obstacle courses and cross country courses. And they push you into such a degraded mental and physical state they, they want to see if you can still maintain discipline underneath those conditions. Now, if you had to do that today to own a Warbird, I don't think you'd get too many people buying them, or even surplus airplanes, or vintage airplanes. But you need a little bit of that discipline to keep your ego in check, and I hope you try to think about that before you go fly. Discipline is everything in flying. Another subject is habit patterns. Um, I can tell you that, that I have a very nice parrot at home and I train him to do certain things. And he's an animal like any other animal. And we as humans are in some ways exactly the same. If I do the same thing with him every day, he will expect the same thing every day. And he will respond in the same way. And that's true of the human. So before you go fly, if you get into an airplane that's new and you haven't flown much, spend some time in there running through all the switches, running through all the checklists until you're very comfortable in the airplane. Too frequently today, 
you know, I see guys jump from airplane to airplane to airplane and don't do that. Well, you're increasing that risk. Let me ask you something. All airplanes that I've ever flown take off and land on the main tanks. I'm assuming everybody would agree with me. Is there any warbird that anybody can think of that does not take off and land on the main tanks? Well, one that comes to mind to me first is a P-38. And the first time I saw one, I said, that's really strange because I've never seen an airplane take off and land on the aux tanks before. And if you got in that airplane and you reverted to your normal habit pattern, you were new to it, and you didn't reinforce that, and you didn't use the checklist, say, oh, I've landed 100 times, I don't need to pull a checklist out and make sure I've gotten everything completed. You're going to have a problem. The other thing is tailwheel airplanes. All tailwheel aircraft generally raise the tailwheel on takeoffs and do a wheel takeoff. There's very few airplanes that do a three-point, except which one? Well, when I got to the B-17, I thought it was very strange that that airplane, you do a three-point landing and a three-point takeoff. And if you try to do that in the DC-3, I'll guarantee you that you're going to go for a ride. There's few people that can do it. They're that skilled and they fly the airplane that much, but basically it's a habit pattern. So when you go from one airplane to another airplane, be careful about your habit patterns and make sure that you're ready to go for the airplane that you're flying. Two other things that I, I'd like to bring to your uh, uh, attention is some people around the airport will say, I always do this or I never do that. You should listen to the, whatever the statements are and find out why that is because it's a good idea that to listen to these people. They've probably learned from some experience and I can tell you hangar flying is an excellent way of passing information on. And today that's basically what we're doing here is we're hangar flying. I'm passing what things that I think are important in flying vintage and warbird airplanes to you as a group. You don't have to agree with them and you certainly don't have to adopt but I wish you would just listen just a little bit and consider them. I call it habit pattern mitigation. Review the systems for each airplane you fly and make sure you do it regularly. Um, I can tell you that the airlines and 135 operators have the lowest accident statistics because they're forced into doing this. They are forced into systematic checks every six months. A lot of times you'll get into somebody else's airplane. I have a friend that lets me fly his N3N, and while it looks like a Stearman, it's considerably different. And when I get in there, I have to remind myself of certain things. It's got a lockable tailwheel. Stearman doesn't have it. It's got four ailerons, and Stearman doesn't have four. It's only got two. I said, well, gee, this is not a Stearman, although it looks like it, and it feels like it. It's not. If you don't lock that tailwheel on landing, you're going to have a great time. You're going to learn what your feet are for. It's a real experience. So make sure you go around all the cockpit switches and handles and levers and look at them and make sure you know what they're for. It used to be an old military joke that if it's not shiny, don't touch it. I don't think that rule's ever changed, not even today. Make sure you know how your systems work because I can tell you that in the last year, I've seen a number of gear up accidents that could have been prevented if, if a person knew how to get the gear down manually. There was no reason to land with the gear up. Make sure you know how it works. Make sure you know how much usable fuel you have. Don't run your tanks all the way down to the bottom. And practice emergency procedures. I can tell you one of the things that the Navy used to do that I really liked is before, every time before you went to fly, we'd go over one emergency item. We'd grind it upside down and why you did this and why you didn't do this and go through it. I would suggest you do the same thing periodically, particularly in the spring, because maybe you haven't flown for three or four months over the winter months, if you're like me, up where there's a lot of snow, and the wind, you know, between the winds and the snow, we haven't gotten out a lot this winter. Make sure you practice your emergency procedures over and over and over again, because if you don't, the second you have a problem, you're going to feel tremendously uncovered. Make sure you know the mechanical status of your aircraft. Um, I mentioned to you before I do a lot of warbird flying. I won't fly anybody's airplane unless I've worked on it. That's just my own personal rule. 
That's what I do to protect me. That's my mitigation strategy, my best practice. I do that and it forces me to know the systems and know the status of the airplane. The last thing I want to talk about in this regard is awareness. Make sure you're fit for flight. Um, Scott Chappelle told me a very interesting story when I was down talking to him a couple months ago about he had a car accident. And I said, wow, how'd you do that? He says, I've never had a car accident before. I said, well, what happened? He says, I take the same road every single day to work. And there's a stop sign about a third of the way to work. And I always stop. And I didn't stop this time. And somebody was coming on a cross street. I said, how come you didn't stop? You know, you saw it? He says, you know, I didn't see it. I said, you didn't remember it was there? He said, no, I physically didn't see it. He said, I just had one of the worst arguments I'd ever had with my wife, and I was driving down the road. I didn't see the stop sign, and the tape in my head was going around and around and around over what she said and how I responded, and it had me so upset. He said, I shouldn't have been in a car. And I would suggest that the same thing is even more true in an airplane. If you're not fit for flight, don't go flying. Just because you go to the AME and he lets you have that medical doesn't mean that you can fly at any time. There's a certain amount of that that's, that's self-approving. You have to look at yourself. Are you mentally prepared to fly? Are you physically fit to fly? If you're not, don't go. This is overly focused is what I'm talking about. <clears throat> if, if you're nervous about getting up and flying in front of a large group of people, um, it's sort of like the first time you expect that and you get over it. But what you're going to see is that once you can relax in front of a group and put on a demonstration of your airplane, you'll start to see more things on the side. And most of these pilots out here, you'll see them talking to you right in the middle of a snap roll and everything else. They are so accustomed to flying that airplane and they know their airplane and the maneuver so well, it's second nature. They don't have to think about it. So make sure you're not overly focused if you're out flying or doing any maneuvers and you'll see what all of a sudden you'll start to see things on the side open up like this and you'll start to see things happening over here with your wingman or over here on the side of the runway and somebody starting to come up on a taxiway. You start to see more things. Make sure you're relaxed because it helps you tremendously with your awareness. Let's get down to the meat of this ta taxi and takeoff operations. Generally, there's a warbird brief anytime there's wavered airspace or any large air show. Um, most of the air bosses are excellent. Make sure you take a pencil and paper and write down everything that they say that applies to the air show. Make sure you listen and learn where the divert strips are and all the other things that you need to know. If you can't get into the single runway here, where are you going to go? In a fast team, we've been pushing lately is ground operations are a critical part of flight operations. For some reason, people don't think there's any risk to them at all when they're on the ground. But going back through the statistics, you saw the number of taxi accidents, which is roughly a third to a quarter of the accidents happening, taxiing out to the runway or taxiing back in. Sometimes it's because of limited visibility of the airplane. In a steerman, you can't see over the nose or some of the older airplanes, Wacos are like that, um, F6X, F6Fs, uh, TBMs, all these Grumman built airplanes are very hard to see over those P-51s. So you see the guys typically their mitigation strategy is the S-turn. But I don't care what kind of airplane you, you fly, you need to look at being very careful about taxing on the ground. Where are your wingtips and where is your prop? And if you're a fairly large airplane, like a TBM, is there anybody underneath you that you can't see? Don't taxi too close to anybody in front of you. And be aware of your prop blast behind you, because you are, as a pilot command, responsible for that prop blast or the prop wake. Some of the other mitigation strategies that you want to think about, about taxing and taking off are performance calculations. Um, I've noticed when I give instruction or I go out and do these like pre-flight pre -flight clinics that we have outside here, nobody is really looking at how many feet it takes to take off or how many feet it takes to land your airplane. 
I can tell you once again, going to a, a structured environment like the airlines, they have performance calculations that are done by the dispatch office and then also the captain looks at them and double checks them. I would suggest you, when you fly your airplane, that you need to sit down and look at what the performance calculations are for your specific operation. If you're in Denver, obviously you're going to have a higher ground speed and require more runway than at Lakeland. But of course it's damp here and it's, I think yesterday it was some 90 degrees. That's going to decrease your performance a lot of both your engine and the wing. Go in there and look at the, the book and most warbirds have excellent performance charts. Now if you don't know how to read those performance charts, call me or go to your local chapter if it's a T28 group or a T6 group. These guys know how to do it. Go back in there and look at those charts. They were developed years ago and they're very good. They'll tell you exactly how many feet it'll take you to take off and land. The other thing is, is when you go, watch how many feet it takes you to get off the ground and then compare that to what the book says. You may notice that for 100 low lead gas, you may not have all the performance that you would have gotten out of 115, which is no longer available. On our B-17, we're the only one in the world that has turbos, and those turbos make up for a lot of that. So I, I can tell you that I watch our takeoffs versus everybody else. We normally get off a little bit shorter. Thank goodness we have the turbos. But if I want to fly a non-turbo airplane, I'd have to go back and look at those performance calculations and make sure on a hot day that I have enough with the gas load I have to get where I'm going and also to get out of that size strip. So please do that. I mean, these are things that, that most people are taught at the private pilot level and I'd like to reinforce, you know, at your current flying level. Weight and balance is something else. Um, most people say, well, I didn't put anything in the airplane and I didn't take anything out but the gas and why should I do weight and balance? Well, that's true, but when an airplane was built, it had a certain weight and balance. And you may have added radios. You might have put an extra oxygen bottle in it. You may have made a modification in the back to put your clothes on for cross country in because most of these single seat warbirds are, have limited space. You know, go back and take a look at what these things do. I can tell you like a Spitfire, the world's fastest airplane in a dive, Mach 8-7, if that aft fuel tank's got fuel in it and you're doing that, you got a problem because you're going to lose control of it shortly. Just that small 37 gallon tank behind the pilot seat will make that big of a difference. You need to look at the weight and balance of your airplane as the airplane currently sits. Look at what modifications you've made, go back and you can change the original data. There's many companies nowadays that will do it for you. We talked about situational awareness. Um, on the ground in an air show like this, there's a lot of things going on. There's people flying above you in orbits. There's people taxing a very different type of airplane. There are balloons coming and going. So be, be aware of what's on the ground. We talked about the S-turns already. And this is a term I want to talk about, progressive taxi. This is basically came down from the military. I know a lot of people heard it before. If you don't know where you are on the ground or you need help, just stop the airplane and if it's a, a towered airplane airport, ask the tower for progressive and they will tell you left, go 20 more feet, go 100 yards, go to the next light or whatever it takes to get you around, they'll direct you. The same is true that when you pull into parking spots out here, watch these ground marshalers very carefully. Don't go too fast and I can tell you that almost every show I've been to in the 17, we're going into a tight spot we only have about 40 feet to go and what does the marshaler do? He's right down the center line of the airplane. I can't see them. I stop and they don't know why I stop because I can't see you. If an airplane stops, the marshals should understand that the pilot can't see them. So the guys, after a while, they get the idea and they'll come over here so I can see them and they can see me. We have eye contact and I know what to do next. But follow the marshalers when you're at a, a tight spot. This is also good on an uh, untowered airport if you're going someplace, watch the line boys. If you don't know, park in some open area and uh, shut the airplane down there. Don't put yourself in a tight spot without either uh, a marshal or somebody watching your wings or your tail. Be careful when you swing your tail because many airplanes, the wing tip will clear but the tail won't. Most of all, taxi slowly. I flew with the same guy who, bless his soul, passed away a couple years ago. 
that he never taxied under 40 miles an hour, and everybody knows who it is. And we used to laugh about it, but the truth of the matter is, is that uh, he was a very good pilot, but he was a World War II pilot. They were taught to crank up and get off the ground as quickly as they can, and not to burn the gas and to taxi fast, and he never modified his flying. That's very dangerous today, taxi slowly, so you know where you are, you can make turns, and you don't get yourself in a compromising position with other aircraft or vehicles on the ground. If you're flying into a towered airport, pattern entry is not too much of a problem. They pretty much tell you where to go and how to enter the pattern. If you're at some place like Sun and Fun or any other air show, um, the air boss is going to tell you what to do and they have fixed flight patterns. Air bosses normally control the field even if there's a tower when there's a waiver in effect. Here's a couple things that we talked about already, but I want to add some warbird specifics to it. In an uncontrolled uh, field, in other words, there's no airport traffic, uh, no air tower, control tower there, Slow to pattern speed, and this gives you time to make decisions about adjusting your pattern if you're unfamiliar with the field, and also to look for other traffic. Make sure you enter at the proper altitude. Now this is a little tricky because some people are used to flying at 800 foot patterns, some people that are in heavier bomber type airplanes are at 1200 foot patterns, and sometimes local regulations dictate non-standard right or left hand patterns and non-standard altitudes. Where are you going to find it? Before you go, look in the airport flight directory, that little green book, and normally they tell you. Also, AOPA has a good airport directory, gives you all that information. Maximize your outside scanning all the time. What do I mean by that? If you're coming into the field, get your gear down early. You know, you don't have to be Jimmy Jet and put it down at the 180. You can put it down farther back in the downwind. It gives you time to do all your pre-landing checks and make sure that you're properly configured for landing. Now you have time to look at the traffic ahead of you and look for other people that may be in a pattern that you missed or someone else missed. This is kind of what I like to see. Um, the V, the big red V on the end of runway 27 there is, is what your final over the approach speed to. And just generally what I do is I add 10 knots increment to each one of them. Now, is this a hard fixed rule? No because some airplanes are different, but generally this will get you slowed down that if you enter the pattern 40 knots over or 40 miles an hour over your final approach speed, you'll, you'll be able to handle this. This also um, prevents you from getting yourself into an overshooting condition on final approach if your speed's down. And it helps you get your hand and eyes coordinated to that slow speed flight that's required for landing. When you land, there's, there's a couple things. Do you want to do a power off landing or a power on landing? I can tell you that it's a power off landing is a thing of beauty and most people are always taught that, but there's certain conditions that you might want to think about keeping some power on. Besides a crosswind, I'm not going to get into crosswinds. I think everybody knows what to do there. But I can tell you when I started flying a B-17, everybody said, gee, you really do good landings, but why are you landing with power? I said, well, I want to control my touchdown and I want rudder effectiveness all the way through the flare, and I don't want to worry about doing this down the runway. They say, yeah, but everybody else just pulls off the power. And I said, well, how's their landings compared to mine? Oh, man, we're hitting the ground and going off the runway sideways and the grass and all. I said, I don't want to hear about it. I understand what you're saying, but when you have a power off, full stall landing, you don't have anything to work with when at the last few seconds. And that's normally why you see loss of control on landing accidents because they're power off and people don't consider that they maybe they should do a power on approach. Maybe you haven't flown for a couple weeks or months. Make sure you manage your flare smoothly. Don't do one of these searching for the ground. Make a nice flare, give the airplane time to settle. Crosswinds, I'm not going to talk about, but I am going to talk about bounce recoveries because if you make a bad landing, make sure that you're comfortable doing a bounce recovery. There's two ways to do it. You can go around, just put the power to it and make sure your right foot comes up with the power or the left foot if it's one of those Russian built engines and go around properly. There's nothing wrong with going around. Or, you know, some airplanes, you, if you're so low and your airspeed is low enough, 
Just hold the yolk back, just release the pressure just a little bit and let it settle down on its own. Two different types of bounce recoveries. If you don't know, go out with an instructor and work on a couple and see what works best for your airplane. It's okay to go around. If you need to, do it. Nobody's going to complain about that. Make sure you do a stabilized ap approach. Um, I like to think 300 feet per nautical mile. If you're a mile out, you got to be 300, 600, 2 miles, 900, 3 miles. That's pretty typical for most airplanes. I don't know any, any other airplane that doesn't do that. But make sure you're stabilized and under control, not decreasing airspeed. We don't do decreasing airspeed or what they used to call decelerated approaches anymore. Just fly a constant airspeed, constant rate approach down. Good landing is a good example for everybody, you know, but look at all these factors that come in here. If you're going to land, run all these things through your mind. How heavy is your airplane? How much runway do you have to work with? How fast is the aircraft? A lot of times what I'll do is if I go into Geneseo with a B-17, if it's early morning and know the grass is wet, I'll make a power off approach. And it might not be a perfect landing, but I know one thing, that I'll, I'll be stopped on a wet grass in 4,800 feet. Um, make sure you don't have a tailwind. A lot of people get caught with a tailwind and they don't realize that a tailwind tremendously increases the amount of runway required for takeoff and landings. Make sure you're on speed. I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen accidents the last year where people are way too fast. And they say, well, I had a crosswind. Well, that's fine, but you still need to get yourself down on speed. Make sure you respect that stabilized approach. Make sure you know if there's a required height of the threshold that you use it. The other thing is, is when you land, put your brakes on. That's part of the goal. Once you're down on the taxi, don't relax now. It's not over. A lot of people relax and they say, well, that's it. I said, well, it's not it. You're not down yet. You're, when you're in the chalks, then you can relax. Half the accidents occur leaving the runway and taxiing back to the ramp. So just slow down, do your S-turns. Stop if you don't know where you are and ask for progressive. Follow your ground marshals in, in tight spots. And make sure you know what those marshalers' uh, instructions are. If you go to a military base, you may see something slightly different than what you're accustomed to seeing in the Airman's Information Manual. Just a couple seconds on the safety culture. I could start out this program saying, I wish I could reduce the accidents, but I really can't. I have to sort of talk you into doing it and you know, making me look good. But you know what that takes? Every person that has a pilot's license needs personal dedication and accountability. It's your attitude and your behavior that determines whether or not you're safe. The other thing, if you don't belong to any of these ABC organizations, you need to think about joining them because they do wonderful things to promote safety. They have processes, they have methods, they have people you can talk to about your specific type of airplane. You're going to have to make a commitment. Aviation is not the J3 Cub that I started out in where I went out, got a service aid teletype, looked at the weather and went flying. Well, it's blue, we can go flying now. It's, those days are gone. It's a little more sophisticated, so you need to make a commitment to learn and to work on things beyond simple adherence to a checklist or procedure. You need to think about keeping a commitment to excellence in your flying and listening to mentors and also spending time studying your airplane and doing something for proficiency training. We like to push in the FAST team the WINGS program and I do it, I love it, I do all these online courses, I'm continually seeing things in there that I'd forgotten about years ago. If you need regulatory information, www.fa.gov has a lot of information and if the safety team which is supports the production studios and everything else, you can find us at fasafety.gov. There's two more things that you can find that come out to the public or safety uh, alert for operators and also information for operators. If you join fasafety.gov and you do proper notifications, these info, information tools will come to you along with such things as advanced notification of TFRs, which is a fairly big subject nowadays. If you have questions about regulatory guidance, please go to the, um, the FISDO guys. This website here, fsims.fa.gov, has most everything that an inspector has, and you can find whatever you need from can I put a data plate on my airplane to 
any other kind of training question. The FAST teams, the OMS, buds into the rest of the industry, and we want you to come to us and talk. We don't do certification, we don't do surveillance, and we don't do enforcement because we want to be able to have an open discussion with you about all kinds of topics. So. And